Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to an episode of End of Growth's The Prism. Today's topic, we're going to be talking about um, leadership in crisis. We're continuing the theme for the first couple of episodes. And if you haven't had time to view those, I really encourage you to go to your favorite social media site, look them up, and really tie in what we're talking about today to how we started this conversation around leading through a crisis. First episode, we walked through some of the key attributes of a great leader, somebody who leads really well in a crisis, you know, attributes like calm under pressure, being a great communicator, being genuine, the ability to plan, communicate that plan, execute that plan. There's a whole long list of attributes that, that can be defined around great leadership in a crisis. Last week, we actually spent most of our time talking about how you actually sustain that leadership during a crisis. And we really came down to trust and credibility being those two big things. You have to walk into the crisis already having that trust and credibility established. And then you have to be able to sustain that trust and credibility um, throughout the crisis. Otherwise, your constituents are going to run away, gallop away um, on a horse and as, as an analogy. So that's kind of what we got at the end of last week. This week, I want to continue the theme, but I want to shift a little bit. And, you know, the beginning of a crisis, you tend to circle the wagons. You want to be able to survive. You get everybody pulled together. You circle those wagons. You get into protection mode. And then things start to settle. You start to get some more information. And during any crisis, you have to be opportunistic because the crisis is going to end. And you want to come out the other side stronger than the way you went in. So sooner than later, you have to start thinking about how can I be opportunistic during this crisis? How can I turn survival mode into thrive? And now you get down to a pivot. And every company that's successful coming out of a crisis creates some t sort of pivot point during the crisis. It's a shift in vision that is opportunistic and relevant against whatever the new normal is going to be. So if you look at things like COVID-19, Every business out there is trying to figure out how they can come out stronger the other side. Some businesses have been fortunate enough to be able to leverage um, elements of the crisis where they're actually helping society, whether it's providing protective equipment or whether it's providing food and other essential goods like a company like Amazon. They're thriving already during this crisis. But a lot of smaller companies and a lot of companies that are on the fringe, they've got to figure out that new normal. They've got to figure out that pivot. And there's a lot of leadership that's involved in creating that pivot. You know, in an in a old normal world, you would pull the team together in a big conference room. You would have a big screen TV up there. You'd be putting slides up there. You'd be showing videos. You'd be having sp speakers up there, motivational speakers. The CEO or the leader would basically be owning the room, creating a ton of energy and, you know, getting everybody literally high-fiving each other and being ready to go against that new vision can't do that today. There is a new normal. The new normal social distancing. The new normal is virtual. So let's talk a little bit about how leaders can pivot to that new opportunity, how they can set a vision, and then how they can create that energy and pull in all of their employees and kind of rally around that flag, rally around that rally point, uh, create that burning platform that everybody can can focus on. And and it's a, it's a cultural thing, too, that we've got to, you know, you got to have a cultural shift that does, does leans into that new normal and embraces it and starts to innovate around it. So, um, you know, whoever one of you want to start with an example you may have seen in the past or even some ideas you've been sitting around looking at this crisis, thinking about it, talking to our clients, talking to our talent pool, um, things like um, new talent needs may come up. A lot of companies have health, environmental health and safety people. Uh, a lot of companies have risk assessment people, but maybe we get a new C-suite position where you literally have a chief health and safety officer, and that's going to change the talent paradigm where you have somebody in a company that's just constantly monitoring what's going on with this with COVID and, and adapting mm -hmm. and adjusting how the workforce performs to handle that. So you know, a little bit of a broad topic, but I, I think it should be robust. So if anybody yeah. wants to jump in, go ahead. I can jump in on that, Mike, and that's a great lead-in. I think, um, you know, when I, when I think about a leader's role in kind of that situation that you described, it's a lot of uh, there's a lot of fog on the battlefield. So so you nobody knows what that new normal is going to look like. Nobody knows uh, where the advantages or the opportunities are going to lie. Um, but as you're kind of resetting the vision or trying to adapt to the new to the new battle space um, and, and, and get a feel for what competition is doing and, and, and what your buyers are thinking, 
um, it's imperative to keep tabs, uh, as many sensors and feelers and probes out in the, out in the market as, as, as possible. Um, so one of the things that I like to do is um, get on the phone with, with a client that would be a typical buyer and just say, hey, listen, I'm not trying to sell you anything today. You know, I just want just want to pick your brain on 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 what are you seeing, you know, with this? And here's a thought I had. And if you really have that um, collaboration or the, um, you know, colleague to colleague type exchange, it really it really helps kind of bring down a lot of the a lot of the curtain of, of what what's uncertain out there. Um, and you start developing more pieces of the puzzle from which to make better decisions as a leader. Um, and so I think the name of the game really is, um, you know, from a leader, from a leader's uh, perspective is really just to understand uh, as much as they can get as many data points as possible. And there's a lot of different vehicles in which to do that and gather information. Um, and sometimes you have to be even more creative uh, given the situation, whether it be COVID or any other, any other crisis um, you have to adapt and, 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 but the underlying fundamental of, okay, I need to understand what's going on in my battle space, in my market, wherever I, I, you know, I'm focused and, and where I make my living, um, you know, and, and to really understand the nuances and the ever changing environment that's going on is, is imperative. So quick question. That, that's a good answer. And that it just led me to this question where I personally don't think what you just said is an all in proposition. I think, um, listening to your existing customers get you some data points that you can use to help your existing client base, but we're all about growing our businesses and, and getting net new customers. And, and often the best ideas are sitting out there in a white space with customers that you haven't gotten yet. So what percentage do you think um, a company should focus on their existing customers as they try to create this new vision? And then what percentage of white space do you think you need to introduce to the process where you're just going to make something up that's net new and you're going to try to drive new market adoptions based on what's changing out there? Yeah, I think Joe, so Joe, Joe led a company through, um, you know, 2008, the recession. So had to, Joe, maybe that's a, a yeah. question for you where it's like, Okay, how do I how do I think? I mean, is it is it is it white space you're looking at? You know, at that point, or is it, hey, how do what are my existing customers? Where my existing relationships lie? What are they thinking? How do I tap into their what's between their two ears to yeah. figure out what they want? Or maybe it's something maybe it's something that that no longer exists, right? And and you're gonna die uh, if you don't if you don't wipe the slate clean and, and create something new. So yeah, kind of that's why I, think, I said it's a percentage, Tim. I think yeah. you do have to take care of your existing customers, and they're gonna yeah. have specific set of needs and you know this comes i don't want to complicate the conversation too much but this comes down to the willingness to self cannibalize so mm -hmm. when i talk about white space and when you innovate and you create new markets those new markets may cannibalize some of your existing client it may not and that's why i said there's a percentage of your business where you can create a sustainability model to take care of your existing customers that you merge but you don't want to lose that opportunity you don't want to, to, to lose the incremental revenue and success factors that are involved in white space creation and innovation and doing something brand new that can get you new customers that you may not be able to get under the old model. And, you know, if we, if we look at some simple things that are happening with, with the way restaurants are going to reopen and they're talking about lonely letting restaurants um, open at 25% capacity. Well, how many restaurants can actually survive by only serving 25% of their tables every night? There will be restaurants that fail because of that model, but I guarantee you there's going to be restaurants that go into the white space, the innovation space, and they're going to find some way to adapt. They're going to find some way to figure it out. You know, it's, it's, so, it, it's so interesting. I, I was, I, I was getting a, uh, a so I've, I've had the same barber for, yeah, not, not me now, but uh, <laughs> 20 for 20 years. Right. So, you know, I text him at the beginning of, of COVID. I'm still got a great relationship with this gentleman. Um, first generation immigrant, uh, just a very successful person, uh, hard worker, patriot, you know, that, that type. And, um, my son is two years old and, and I was bringing, I said, his name's Alex. I said, Al, not my son, but my barber's name's Alex. I said, Alex, how are you doing with the COVID thing? I mean, you haven't been able to go to work. It's a very high cash business. Um, you know, and so, so he said, yeah, I'm doing all right right now, but, um, you know, I'll, I'll, 
I'll text you if, if, if something comes up or so he texted me the other day and said, Hey, I'm doing house calls. And I said, great. My two year old son, Luke needs a, needs a haircut. And so he came over in his N95 mask and was cutting Luke's hair. And, um, you know, I said, I said, what are you going to do? I mean, how do you think your business is going to change after this? And, um, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about just this, this, this exchange that we're having. I'm like, this guy's in my, in my kitchen, you know, cut my son's hair. How many professionals are going to be home now because of COVID that, you know, if you think about like dry clean, the dry cleaning business and the, and, and the home pickup and that sort of thing, why not have a barber that goes, you know, does house calls and you could probably charge a premium for that because it's, you know, you're, you're hopping in a car, you're meeting the customer. Um, it's a huge on demand type type service, but you know, maybe that's how his business changes because he can't have a waiting room full of people anymore um, mm-hmm. where it's not acceptable. Yeah. So it's interesting, even even like small businesses like that, you know, are, are having to completely rethink um, how they're going to how they're going to serve and make uh, make a living. Awesome. That's great. You know, it's, a, it's a great observation. That's a good example of a pivot right there. And so either Jim or, or Joe, sure. let's get back to the start of the conversation when I talked about yeah. you're a leader, you've created or at least started to shape a new vision that's going to support the new normal. You decided your company has to pivot to get there. Uh, Let's say you have a, you know, good sized workforce, hundreds of people, not, not dozens, maybe even thousands. A bunch of them are virtual now. How do you as a leader now go in and create that energy to do a transformation? As I said, the historical way is you get everybody together, you create this energy in the room, all the high fives with each other, you create that burning platform. How can you do that virtually? How can you recreate that amount of energy and buy-in and commitment you're going to need for your company to make a big pivot into the new normal? Jim, look like you were chomping at the bit to say something. I'll let you jump on first. <laughs> That's the good thing about us seeing each other, right? you got the body right. language going. Oh, I got an example. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, you know, it's kind of funny. Uh, I also do a, a podcast. It's called the Iron Sharpens Iron Movement. There's a little plug for it. Um, it's on all the things, Iron Sharpens Iron Movement. And I just interviewed somebody, Mike, called a futurist. His name's Jared Nichols, and, it, and his actual title is a futurist. And I was like, so are you a guy that you know, like looks into a crystal ball and can <laughs> see five years down the road? You know, what's going on? No, and he, he's kind of just a uh, long-term strategist, really, and they call him futurist. But this was an interesting thing that we talk about the pivot and how we do this. To determine the future, you really you, you never know what the future really is going to be. But as a leader, to help determine that, you create the narrative. And mm-hmm. the organizations that create the narrative now for what the future is going to look like are going to be the ones that come out ahead. Yeah. And so this is to your point, I think, Mike, about how you were saying like, you know, okay, all of a sudden we're deciding to pivot. How do we communicate it? The first thing is, is to create this narrative. Like, what does the future look like? And I think the leaders need to paint that picture. They need to paint the picture and then do it through all different type of venues. Because just like anything else, it comes down to being humans. So when you were like, well, how do we do it in a virtual world? I think they have a leader has to be very sensitive to own the narrative and be able to paint that picture through every way that a human would think of. So there's people that love to read that can take it by reading. So I think you actually have to distribute things through a talking paper, say. There's people that are visual. You need to paint that picture either whether it's in their head or have these virtual town halls like we're doing right now. Have speeches, have commercials, all those things. I think there's so many people that see things differently because they're humans, they take it in differently, kind of like from a strength finder's point of view, what is your strengths? But um, the leader should communicate that vision in all of those avenues, but own the future by creating the narrative. That's the key takeaway, I think, what they need to do and then figure out how to do it. And I think there are a lot of smart people, even in the world of psychology, to figure out how is we being in a virtual environment, still going to be able to accept all that information. So that's what I was chomping at the bit, Joe, because I was like, I just talked to a guy about (laughs) about that. That's that's an awesome answer. And, you know, as you guys all know, for several years at End of Growth, we're always talking to our clients about pulling the future forward. We don't we don't do succession planning by backfilling. We do succession planning by future filling. Um, so that all ties in and, you know, it's yeah. just going out and getting the narrative together. And you know, I think we call it a vision story internally. And, you know, you get a new vision story rolling and, 
Um, to me, the big the big thing is being able to translate that vision story into something that can be executed um, virtually. You know, it makes it a little bit more challenging. And even getting the vision right is, you know, I liked Tim's analogy at the beginning. And you know, we're in the fog of war right now, and we've got limited information. So, you know, you've really got to be hyper creative. And there's going to be some risk involved. You could miss and but, um, you know, I'm already seeing a lot of different things every day that, that pop up online where people are trying out new business models. They're trying out new ways to do outreach. They're trying out new advisory methods. They're trying out different type of products. And, you know, whoever thought that cloth face masks would become, become a sub economy in the United States yeah. and, you know, things like that. Twenty five bucks a pop for a face mask with the New England Patriots on. And I did order one. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> you know, there is, a, there is a sub economy out there. And. Um, so people are innovating on the fly and, yeah. but, you know, somebody made that pivot with, you know, whatever capability they had, um, they decided to pivot their business into making cloths face masks with sports logos on them. Fanatics has done that. Fanatics is a famous yeah. sports, sports, um, apparel company, and they're focusing now on, on branded face masks for all the major sports teams. So people are making these pivots in real time as we go. And I think any good leader out there, um, leading in times of crisis has to be incredibly change inviting. They have to embrace that white space and they have to do that pivot and come up with something brand new for their company to be able to thrive coming hey, on the Mike, other side. If I could interrupt you for sure, a second, Joe. I have, um, you know, I have a, I have two examples I can share, but one of which you're probably not going to like very much. So first and foremost, let me say hello to everybody. I apologize for this this uh, chia pet that's growing on top of my head. Um, you, you don't have Tim. You don't have Tim's barber friend. <laughs> yeah, what's yeah, that problem over. like? <laughs> uh, and you can probably see right above my head uh, a hat, Philly, uh, Philadelphia Phillies. But I want to talk about one pivot that is amazing to me, uh, which was the Philadelphia Eagles. And um, uh, huh. and you, Mike, I'm going to sign off now. This is. It. <laughs> <laughs> You know, a few years ago when uh, their star quarterback went there, they actually had probably five of their stars go down and the wheels were falling off the bus, as so it seemed. And talk about pivoting, Doug Peterson pivoted, in my opinion, it was one of the best coaching jobs I've seen outside of Bill Belichick because he's pretty amazing. But nonetheless, taking a backup quarterback um, who's pretty good and, and running an RPO offense, which is not what they were running all year long, and having the team and the leaders on that team adjust Taking them all to the Super Bowl and winning, which against your lovely Patriots, which was which was fantastic. But I, I just thought that was an amazing, uh, from a sports perspective, you can I think you can relate that to anything. Uh, but when all things seem to go wrong, they fig they figure out a way, dug their heels in, and he did an amazing job as a leader, and the rest of the team bought into what they were doing. That was amazing. Um, back to Tim, you had mentioned you had asked me in the beginning, um, and I don't. Uh, you know, I don't want to talk about myself, but I'll just give you a great example of, of, of what we did back in 28 or 2008-9. Um, you know, when the market was going south then, it was um, an opportunity, I think, exists for anybody. And I think it's a chance where, um, Tim, to your point, it's, it's what do you do? And what, what we did then was we didn't take our focus off what we did. We had folks do it. But what we did was we took a gamble and a risk and went out and, and hired folks and also added some more responsibility to some of our current folks to start a new division. And a division that during that time was doing well, which was the, was, was the staffing contingent labor force, which we didn't do any of before prior to that. Um, but that was something that helped get us through the recession. And then coming out of the recession, um, our team stayed robust. Our team stayed in contact with all of our client base. We didn't, we didn't, we didn't forget about our clients even for a second. Um, and I think that was a good thing, one. And then two is I think one other thing, going back to one of the questions you asked, Mike, this is just something I think could be done. And I don't know whether it's uh, applicable to a, you know, to an Amazon, but, uh, well, they, I don't think they need help right now, but, um, but to a large company where maybe, now well, here's an idea, maybe give folks an opportunity to create a reward, uh, could be financial, could be something, where you give every employee a chance to submit what their best idea for the mm -hmm. business. How does that business pivot? Give the people an opportunity to buy in. Give them an opportunity to speak, present. And that could be the janitor, it could be anybody. Yeah. But I think if you offered that opportunity, whether you're 100 people or 2,000 or 10,000 employees, if you gave that opportunity to every employee and gave them a chance to present it, I think you create a lot of buy-in, a lot of buzz that can be done remotely. Um, that's just a thought, but- um, Yeah, you know, that, that brings up a great point 
uh, Joe, because as I was thinking about today's topic, um, you know, I think the the underlying theme, if you look at throughout history, I mean, organizations on the commercial side, even militaries, you look at like the Napoleonic Wars or what Adolf Hitler was doing. I mean, there's a lot of lessons that can be learned. And, and I think the biggest underlying theme of, of everything is is innovation. Um, so how do you, how do you how do you adapt and overcome is through innovation and entrepreneurial uh, uh, mindsets. Um, and I think you know when you're when you, uh, at a large like, take COVID for instance, great e can be thinking, wow, geez, you know this is a big this is you know I was I was the middle guy, and now this 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 thing came along completely outside of everybody's control. But how I react to it. Um, is going to allow me to make up more ground and close the gap or maybe leapfrog competition. So I think it's, it's, it's reframing the mindset of, you know, crisis is a, is a, is, is inherently a negative word. Um, but maybe, maybe reframing it like a unexpected opportunity. opportunity. Yeah. And if you think about it that way and you get in that mindset, now you're, now all of a sudden your, your, your creative juices start flowing. Now you're thinking about, okay, how do I navigate my canoe down the river? better than the next guy next to me so that I, so that I can win. Um, and I think that's a big reframing the mindset early on and thinking innovation is a, is a, is a good azimuth to start with. And if you yeah, think about a, it, it's, sorry, this is a unique situation because we are losing lives, but at the same time, every crisis does present opportunities. And yeah. um, I don't want anybody in our, our listening audience to think that's a cold statement. It's just a hard fact yeah. that opportunities arise from any type of crisis, whether it's something like a, a virus pandemic or an economic crisis or, or a structural crisis. <clears throat> We've always had opportunities and business changes arise from them. So, yeah, you know, I, I think what Tim's saying is important that you have to in some ways embrace that and, and pivot to a new vision and and figure out how you're going to ride that right on that new opportunity. And I love Joe's comment about innovation. My old company, we actually had an annual innovation competition. It ran for 11 months and any employee in the company would submit ideas. And there was a hierarchy of submitting ideas where you do within your function. And if the idea passed the staff level of your function, so, you know, the engineering senior vice president, um, he would nominate three ideas from his business group, et cetera, et cetera. Marketing would nominate three ideas from their business group. And then we would have an innovation conference at the end of the year where the three ideas from each of the different business groups would be put into a super competition with judges. And then the winners of that competition would be guaranteed um, personal rewards as well as their ideas getting productized within the company. So it's pretty cool. Great way to, great. to get everybody involved. You know, I think when when you define it by a crisis instead of a steady state thing, I, I think organizations, to Tim's point, was really like, if you think of them like humans, too, it's fight, flight, or freeze. Mm -hmm. I think it's, you know, it's these organizations that decide to fight what's happening right now, and they become the ones that pivot quickly and all that stuff. The ones that flight, right, they're the ones that bail out and can't <clears throat> think straight. They become indecisive, and the ones that freeze literally are the ones that are going to be left behind in a crisis. So if you think about it, right, it's fight, flight, freeze with humans because it's all the humans that are making decisions for all these organizations. And Tim's barber is a, is a prime example of he's fighting the crisis by yeah. being innovative. And it's all about innovation. And, and those that, you know, either leave or freeze, they're just going to be left behind in a time of crisis when we're talking leadership in a business context. Yeah, I think even, even look at society adapting other than business. And um, over the weekend, I saw that um, birthdays now, because people can't have birthday parties, the, the family is driving by the house with the kid in the driveway with happy birthday signs and balloons and singing happy birthday as they have a parade of cars drive by a home and our, our um, Zoom based happy hours. You know, people are having yep. virtual happy hours on Saturday evenings with their friends on Zoom and they pick a drink of the week or a snack of the week or, you know, whatever you want to put in there. So we're seeing adaptations everywhere and we're seeing society pivot from a social standpoint. We're seeing businesses pivot. But I, I, you know, I do want to focus on the fact that the businesses that create that net new vision quickly and they pivot quickly are going to be the successful ones. You They're going to come out the other side much stronger than the people that keep those wagons circled to the end. 
You know, another good example, the, the barber type example that Tim gave, uh, I watched this morning having coffee, uh, the local um, hardware store was the, f and I, when, they, when they had this commercial, I was like, they win because they were the first store to say, we are the only people in the area that install plexiglass now for all your businesses that we'll put between the restaurant petitions that we'll put you know at the bank mm -hmm. teller like, they were the first local company to say we're your petition guys for the covid post covid thing and i'm like there it is there's innovation there was the pivot right these this local company said we're going to be known as the people to be post covid construction for you yeah, that's a great example of how talent's going to shift too and we we're in the yeah, talent yeah. business and i had mentioned earlier that um, employee safety, employee health and safety is probably going to become a C-suite position. And you can see manufacturing facilities now where they not only have supervisors that monitor the manufacturing workflow, but they're going to have safety supervisors. They're yeah. going to have safety supervisors that monitor social distancing, that monitor protective equipment, that monitor how the facility is decontaminated and cleaned every day and you know how people enter and exit the building that's going to monitor testing. You know, when we get back open, there's going to be a lot of testing done of employees going in and out of um, facilities every day. So there's now another economic shift in talent to a different skill set. Yeah. We're talking yeah. about how we're going to get enough people to do tracing, contact tracing when, when we start doing testing. And that's going to create another workforce that didn't exist a month ago. So people are doing a lot of things now. You can see the activity happen. You can see the ideation. You can see it reacting to the virus from a social standpoint and a business standpoint. And then there's going to be some businesses that figure out the big breakthroughs, how they're going to create a sub economy for themselves and whether that's going in and retrofitting um, restaurants so they're safe or whether it's going in and retrofitting businesses or whether it's working full time at a business as a health and safety um, chief health and safety officer. There's going to be all kinds of new talent opportunities here. and and um, new ways for people to get new jobs. Yeah. Yeah, one, one other thing too, I think is important, um, you know, as companies are downsizing and th they have to cut costs to, to, to survive, unfortunately. Um, I think one thing that people sometimes miss the target on is actually talent acquisition. This is an actually, in my humble opinion, I think it's a great time to maybe attract someone from your biggest competitor that you couldn't before. Because maybe that competitor isn't pivoting well enough, or maybe that person you're trying to get doesn't have the faith in their leader to make it through this. Mm. So it could be a good time to go out and attract some top talent uh, from some of your competition during this time. Uh, not to mention those companies um, uh, may go under, uh, some companies are gonna go under where you can attract talent from. So I think it's just something to keep, you know, for business owners, business leaders to keep their eyes on is, is keep the eye on, on, on a really good talent that's out there because I think it could be a good opportunity to attract some of those folks as well. That's, that's a key, awesome point. That's a, that's a key point there too because I, I don't know, you know, this this there's no doubt that COVID's impacted and probably will change uh, uh, how we work for years or decades or forever. But I, I think we need to be careful about falling into assumptions like, oh, it's going to change it to this degree, right? So... I think the key theme is, well, maybe you're not looking for, for chief safety officers or health officers. Maybe you're, uh, you're maybe you're just the, the, the underlying theme. It's, it's, it's more, how do I find really talented people that are creative that if I grow and scale, I'm not that big cargo ship. That's, that's, un, I've got an under, under uh, sized rudder, uh, that, you know, to the extent that the sea doesn't change, they're just plowing through. But the minute that that sea the sea conditions change, they're 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 going to be in trouble because they can't pivot, right? And so, how do you keep your organization as that speedboat, you know, instead of that big cargo ship with the undersized rudder? Is the key um, because your crystal ball is as clear as mine. I, you know, I don't know what I mean. I know I know probably this will impact things to what degree? Who knows? What if there's a vaccine in September that? wipes the thing out and it's, it's non-existent. What, I, what then? Do people forget about it? Do they go back to the way they've been doing things? And if so, how am I positioning my talent, my in-house talent to be able to, to, to still thrive in, in, in that scenario? So I think it's, it's, it's important to also maintain a little bit of balance in, in, in how you're planning uh, the future of your organization as well. So, so you guys Which keep is, going with that because one of our sub themes of the prism is adaptive leadership. 
So what Tim's just talking about is adaptive leadership and, and you're actually talking about putting a pivot on top of a pivot on top of a pivot and, you know, being very adaptive, depending on what things going on. So you yeah. guys pull the thread on that. You know, if, if yeah. you're a, if you're a leader out there, how, how can you stay that nimble, that agile and be that adaptive? Yeah, I think I, I think too. Uh, you know, a perfect a perfect uh, like kind of uh, vignette of of this was I don't know if you guys read uh, We Were Soldiers Once and Young, Colonel Hal Moore with LZ X Ray. So that was that was the United States military. Nobody's nobody's bigger, more bureaucratic, with more red tape than the U.S. military. Um, and they were they were they were trying this new thing out, air mobility, and they thought they were going to go into this LZ X Ray with a with, with a bunch of helicopters and drop a uh, drop a cap a cavalry battalion in, in there, and they were going to fight uh, an enemy that was half their size. Well, it ended up being uh, outnumbered eight to one, uh, and so how did you know how more you talking you're talking about consequences and crisis way bigger than what we're dealing with now yet this guy somehow figured out how to how to adapt real time very quickly understand the landscape the battlefield figure out data points as fast as possible and make quick decisions i think that's that's exactly what we need in business leaders and biz, and people that are leading organizations today is okay we we go in with this plan and, and then that plan goes to crap right so what happens what happens with the talent that i have what have I done prior to this to train that talent to be able to think and 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 adapt on the fly, and it all you know it all works in in, in harmony once once you know things things uh, things hit the fan, and so I think that would be a perfect you know if you're thinking out there that hey I'm a leader of a you know a, a one billion plus organization or um, even if you're a small barber right like the the fundamentals still apply in any of those scenarios. You're not, you're not too big. You're not too uh, politicized or bureaucratic to be able to be nimble. So what happens, Tim, if you're in the middle of a crisis and obviously your team's incredibly important and you find out that you didn't do a good job recruiting your team and they're not performing well in the crisis, do you think it's, it's a good idea to just try to ride it out and then fix it later? Or do you think you need to try to fix that team in real time? What do you guys think of that concept? I think you got to cut bait fast. Yep, fast. Yeah. Fast, really fast, yeah. Yeah, you opinion. know, it's 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 the old analogy of, you know, fire fast, hire slow kind of thing. I mean, when you, when you have that dead weight like that, you have to do this. And it's just all of this brings back to the point that during a crisis is not the time to develop leaders. You need to be working on developing yep. your leaders yep. well before a crisis. Do you and think you have can... That do you think Tim, you can find new leaders, though, in the middle of this? If you decide to do switches, do you think you're going to I be think, able to get companies, people yeah. to change jobs in the middle? Cream rises to the top, too. You know, I think uh, a lot of organizations will find that they have leaders within their organizations that just weren't in the developmental period pyramid yet, or they were two line supervisors below and they were off the radar. People are going to shine. People are going to rise to the occasion. And leaders, natural leaders, will naturally lead. So let the cream so, rise to the crop, not yeah. rise to the top, and then go get it. And to Joe's point, though, too, like the leadership of an organization must keep their eyes out there at all times to gather intelligence that if there is leaders to be found, they should go. This is the opportunity to find them for sure. Yeah, I just want to add to that, Jim, because you know what? It's funny. Um, I've been doing this for almost 20 years, and I've seen, unfortunately, uh, I've seen really, really good professionals who are tremendous leaders. Uh, unfortunately, not you know, out of jobs, especially during 08, 09. Uh, and the reason why they were then was because a lot of times, not you know, sometimes, let's put it, you know, somebody who's really good and strong, they'll get pushed out because their leader in their organization, whether it be the CEO, CFO, whoever, um, feels a little bit intimidated by that person, doesn't want that person upset in the apple cart. But then when a crisis like this happens, those people are out there. And it's a great opportunity, for, to your point, Jim, to go out and get somebody who who has that leadership capability um, and maybe cut bait with somebody who's just not cutting it right now. Um, mm -hmm. But it's, 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 it's a good time to do, in my opinion, it's a good time to do that. Yeah. All right. So we talked about innovation. We talked about pivots. We talked about team talent. Uh, we talked about the ability to... to um, Hey, my Mike, if I can interrupt you one more time, sorry, sure. I keep I keep doing that to you. But um, and Jim, you know, you've 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 had uh, you know you're unbelievably decorated in your military career. You've you've been with large uh, consulting with large organizations. Mike, um, you've worked for large organizations. Um, Tim, same thing. 
Yeah. My question, because I've only worked for you know smaller organizations, but you know when you feel like you have to turn around the Titanic in a bathtub, that has to be an extremely overwhelming feeling. Yeah. Um, and my question to you guys is, you know, just kind of playing devil's advocate is, is, is yeah, is where do you begin, right? Like if you're if you're a multi-billion-dollar organization, and this is the first time you're going through something like this crisis, which is I think it's a first for everybody, really. Um, where where does one begin you know and i think um i can say from my experience it was you know it was small organization so it was easier but in a huge company turning that aircraft carrier around the bathtub is is a daunting task you know yeah, so you have to you have to begin with where you are as an organization and you have to be realistic about what you have so yeah. if you did your job right over the years you built even large organizations where there's a lot of teamwork there's a lot of collaboration. Um, people like being there with each other. Um, you have a culture that's that's not only change accepting, that culture has to be change inviting. They have to be ready to change when you need to do those pivots and they have to know how to change. They have to know how to be adaptable. Um, so if you have all those attributes already built into your organization before the crisis hits, you can keep turning the ship when you have to. If you created an organization that is slow and a little bit of teamwork, not a lot of collaboration, not a lot of agility, it's a change adverse culture, you're in big trouble because you're yeah. not going to change that in the middle of the crisis. You know, it's going to be incredibly hard to pivot from uh, something like that. Yeah, but time time is of the essence right now, right? So you don't have a tremendous amount of time to to pivot a huge company. It has, it has to happen quickly. Right. Yeah. So, so, so if you did your job right and you do you have that change inviting and you have that collaboration and teamwork, you can do it quickly. But the, the, the companies that don't have that culture and they're yeah. change adverse are going to be in big, big trouble. Yeah. They're going to have a very hard time doing it, yep. no matter what the size. So we, we just got a viewer comment about yeah. how do you show your visibility in your company? Um, so I'll let you guys answer that. We're in a virtual world here. And what's the what's the best way? to get in front of your people and to maintain that energy and be able to translate that energy. We talked about this early on. How do you trans that, translate that energy virtual? It's a lot easier to do in the room where you can really sense it versus doing it in a, in a video and things like that. I, I think one of the first things I would say is uh, <clears throat> if, our, if our viewer has not seen last week's episode to go back and watch last week's episode because it almost directly relates to this entire point you know because it was about building trust ahead of time it was about communicating it was about being authentic it was about being that leader that is always out in front of the organization before it's the crisis time because if all of a sudden you're an employee and it's the first time you've seen the boss because he's trying to do this gee whiz stuff and be cool and virtual reality it's the wrong time and uh, he's lost trust, all of those kind of things. So I so, think uh, the episode that we talked about last week is a, is a great tee up for this question. So playing devil's advocate with you, uh, Jim, yeah. what happens if you're an employee of a company like that and yeah. they're feeling mad leader is just, he's been non-existent or she's been non-existent and now all yeah. of a sudden they're trying to play hero. What yeah. do you do? Yeah, it's tough, right? I mean, that's, that's, that's the problem. That's, that's why there's a difference between management and leadership. You know, like they were managing things. They were managing even acting like people were things instead of leading where you lead people. And so the, the issue is the leader is the one who caused that issue, right? So now you're the employee, yeah. you're completely, there's no trust and all that stuff. That's a hard hill to climb. Yeah. I it think that absolutely I, is, but I you've think got you to start earning it. You know, you've got to start re-earning it back to that. Well, you, you look at it like an opportunity too. So if yeah. you're that younger, if you're that younger, more innovative rising star and your your manager leader is not leading um that's an opportunity where you, you use that you use that crisis or that opportunity to basically say hey this guy this guy right here is he's under the microscope right now everybody is so how do i empower him make him look good by being innovative and then sure you know you you help you help that leader out you help that manager out you you get them further down the road than they would be otherwise um all of a sudden you've just you know stood out made yourself so, visible so if i'm the low man on a totem pole so to speak i'm a staff mm -hmm. employee or whatever it doesn't matter not non-manager you're saying go to my manager 
and ask whatever, what can I do to help and, and try to be innovative myself and try to offer that help? Because again, I'm, cons I'm just coming at this from a, a perspective of an employee and, and what they would be feeling. And holy Lord, like, my gosh, my leader has been distant forever. We don't ever hear from this person. And all, all of a sudden, you know, again, they're trying, but it's just not, it's just not penetrating at all. There's a, there's a great term, Joe. Uh, you know, everybody's kind of heard of 360 degree leadership or yep. 360 degree leading where you can lead it anywhere in the organization. But there's another cool term called voicing up. And if you start to kind of create that culture, even if it's the first time you did it once you're in the crisis and say, we have a voice up culture now. We want everybody to Tim's point. Everybody feel free. They're empowered to voice up, acknowledge it especially if you're a leader that's behind the eight ball. If all of a sudden you're like, man, I didn't do any of this at, before, and you create this voice up culture, find someone that's like Tim's example and make sure that you're um, exposing them, that you're saying, I, I heard this, this person's ideas. We acknowledge their ideas. We're gonna take action on those ideas, all of those things. Then you really empower that voice up. You get out of group think, you get empowerment, you get all of those kind of things. And, and a lot of people, especially in bigger organizations, because I was there, is you know, a lot of folks at those higher levels, higher, higher, higher level management positions or leadership positions uh, are risk averse at that point. So yeah. you're empowering the most innovative class of your organization by creating that environment where it's where it's, hey, we're going to reward risk taking and maybe maybe be having having some self-awareness that says, you know what, the folks that are leading this ship right now that are trying to turn this turn this boat around in the bathtub. Uh, are actually the, the 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 most risk averse among us, right? And they're not the people to be innovating and steering this shift through crisis. Yeah. But that means that the leader himself but, has to be humble enough. They got to be able to put their ego aside. They got to be self-aware enough yeah. to be able to take the handcuffs off and to empower their workforce all the way down to the lowest levels to get something done. That's very that's very hard to do because if that leader goes into the crisis not empowering their employees and being somebody that's risk adverse and wants to be in total control, it's going to be incredibly hard during a crisis for that leader to take the handcuffs off. And hey, I just want to do a quick shout out, shout out Alvaro from um, Lima, Peru sends his regards. Thank you for joining us from so far away. It's a pleasure wow. to have you here. Um, yeah. So, you know, the, yeah. I think the good leaders will find ways to pivot multiple times and, whether that's pivoting to a new normal that becomes the old normal and they pivot a second time and empowering the employees, creating innovation, you know, um, letting their employees work from the bottom up in terms of, of driving ideas. I think that's going to happen. I think some of the businesses that, that um, don't have that great leadership, it's going to be unfortunate because they won't be able to do those pivots and, you know, egos of, of C-suite executives are, are well documented and some of them are just not going to be able to admit and be self-aware enough to, to change during this crisis and, and to let better things happen and take advantage of those opportunities. It's kind of sad in a way. Right. And, and, that's know, where I, and that's where I wanted to push back a little bit, guys. And, and again, just I think Jim and, and Tim, you guys gave great examples what the leaders can do. But here's my question again for those who are watching who aren't the leaders, but they're more so just the employees. What happens if the leaders don't do those things? What should those employees do? In your guys' opinion, what, what should those guys do? Should they be out looking for to, to go to another company where there is better leadership? Um, but what should those folks do? Is there any, any, do you guys have any good thoughts from your experiences in larger organizations where those employees, where they don't have a voice because there is so much red tape and the leaders aren't stepping up, is there any ideas there that we can offer? It, it depends. And, you know, Jim and yeah. Jim and Tim will have a strong military view of how it works there. But in business, um, depends on the culture, right? So right. Mm -hmm. if you're a lone voice, doesn't matter how loud you talk, right? If right. the culture, if the culture isn't one where people are going to gather around you and you have great ideas and help you support those ideas and work those ideas up the management chain, it's going to fail. And, wow. and in those circumstances, I, I think the first thing you said, you got to find another job. You know, if you're somebody that really wants to try to lead and you want to pick up the ball and run with it and nobody else around you will block for you or you will help you, then it's time for a new job. <clears throat> if you can articulate what you want to do and you actually have people flocking to you and gathering around you and willing to block with you and willing to help you elevate that idea, then you get a good shot at it. You know, the, it might be a little bit risky if the company culture is, is stifled, but if you're willing to take that risk and, and keep trying to pick up that ball and, and keep moving it forward to get to the goal line, you get a shot. 
So it really is you also, a couple of things. If, if I'm giving advice, it would be, look, leaders uh, in companies and organizations, even in the military, think in terms of, of resources that you have to invest and return. And so if you can, if you can knock that equation out for them and, and, and then allow them to either check yes or no on the box, like that's, that's a, that's a perfect way to kind of tell if, Hey, I'm going to have a leader that's going to, that's going to embrace this type of, of, of idea or I'm not. And, and I should revert to, to basically looking to go elsewhere. And so I think that's probably, I think that's probably the best way to say, you know, instead of going to your leader and saying, Hey, I had this great idea, but, 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 you know, they hear great ideas all day. What's that great idea in terms of resource expenditure and what's the return? And yeah, it may be risky and, and we might have to dial up the risk a little bit, but here's what's on the other side of this if we succeed. And if you make that argument at, at a lower level of an organization to a leader, it's a totally different, you're approaching it at a totally different angle than, than most. So value-based. I, I agree. Yeah, no, I agree. Um, yeah, it, it is. You're exactly right. And I, and I, Tim, I'm glad you said that because that, that was kind of what I was getting at. You know, there, a lot of people have ideas, but they're not ideas that, that will take a, a business leaders uh, or get their attention enough to say, oh, this is something that will really transform this organization because they're not mm -hmm. coming to them with solutions. They're just coming with an right. idea, not exactly a solution to a problem. And I think that's something for people to keep in mind is, is everyone has ideas, but what is the solution to the problem and, and, and taking everything into consideration? I think that's an important, a very important component. Uh, yeah, and it's a, it was a great question and a great concept. And if you're somebody that loves generating ideas and you want to be valued and you want to create value and your company doesn't embrace that or have systems and processes that let you um, have a chance to, you know, to move that value creation up the food chain, you really are in the wrong company. Yeah. Um, you know, you need to go find somebody. That, that yeah, because at that point, do with you. At, at that point, you know, hey, I'm in an organization that doesn't value like me or talent or, or innovation, you, you know, at that point, it's clear, but I would say, don't just float a few ideas. And if they get shot down say, Oh, throw your hands up. Right. That's it. Do it, do it in a way that's like a, making a business case. Hey, this is the value I, I propose that we create and here's how we do it. And here's what it's going to cost you. Um, if you do it that way uh, and you make a good case. And I think, you know, if you get slapped around at that point by a leader, that's not a good leader and you don't want to be a part of that organization. Mm -hmm. So. Absolutely. Agreed. Agreed. All right. Any other any other pieces of advice in terms of pivoting in a crisis? No, I think um, you know. I, 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 to your point, Mike, a little earlier, you said uh, you used the word cannibalization, um, which I think is a it's an aggressive it's an aggressive term. It 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 means different things to different peoples. But don't be afraid. Don't be afraid to cut a limb off, you know, to save the tree. Um, and I think that's, I think that, you know, where you talk about, Hey, I think our last conversation or previous conversations, um, we were talking about, you know, your, your, you know, you, what you owe to your people in terms of subordinates as a leader, um, and, and, and how to be, um, loyal to them. And there is a point where the, the, you know, you're not in a philanthropic organization and you have to this thing has to survive right um because you know you have to as leaders we have to maintain uh you know a certain level of profitability and revenues and that sort of thing so you can do more good um that's what's great about business um and and sometimes in in downward turns you have to you have to cut a limb off um and it happens in nature it happens. It happens everywhere in the natural world, and and, it, and there's no there's no reason it shouldn't happen in business, but it needs to be done with the right left and right parameters. Yep, awesome. That's an awesome point, and <clears throat> a lot about balance of this whole thing. That's why I said at the beginning that you know what percentage would you do sustaining activity for net new innovation? So, Correct. hey guys, I think I think we had a great conversation today, and I want to thank everybody that that joined us. And it looks like we got people from around the world, which is pretty cool yeah. here. Um, really happy with that. And so thank you all for being here. Um, you know, call to actions. If, if you're a leader out there right now and you're listening to this and your company's got those wagons circled tight, you really got to start thinking about when you're going to loosen that circle and, and do that pivot and start being opportunistic in terms of how you want to come out of this crisis stronger than you went in it. I think that's a very important thing to do and, and get your people together, trust your people, get your whole team together and empower your whole workforce to, 
to get up there and, and innovate for you and it would make life a lot easier. Uh, I want to remind everybody that End of Growth has a live broadcast every day at 11 a.m. Eastern Time, Monday through Friday. The Prism's on Monday, every Monday, and we have four other shows that are on Tuesday through Friday with different topics that are also very interesting. So thank you for joining us today, and I want to thank the the Endergrow team on the line. We've had Tim Dunn, who's our chief commercial officer, and Jim O'Tailing, who's our president, and Joe Nicholas, and he's the guy with the hair with the <laughs> principal and senior consultant. So uh, I think I'm the only Patriots fan on the line, but th that's okay. And we all we'll hold it against team. you, Mike. <laughs> Don't hold it against me. <laughs> so I uh, hope to see you all next Monday at 11. Take care.